Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Sober Yoga Girl. I am very excited to have Lisa Ryan sitting with me here today. And Lisa is joining from Brisbane, Australia. So it is in the afternoon where she is, and it is morning here in Abu Dhabi, which is super cool. And we got connected maybe a month or two ago through our mutual friend, Sarah Williamson, who Sarah was one of my first guests on the podcast way back when I first started the show. And she also was part of our Sober Curious Yoga Week that we had last month. So Lisa, it is really exciting. And I'm really happy to finally meet you and have you here. So welcome, Lisa. Oh, thank you so much. It's really exciting. Uh, It was a, a very nice surprise to be asked. Thank you. And how are you doing today? I'm great. It's not too exciting in Brisbane. Uh, It's a very cloudy day today. We had beautiful weather on the weekend, so uh, it was a bit of a shock for Monday. But, you know, pretty good. Got to take the good with the bad, don't you? So it's all good. Is that how you pronounce it, Brisbane? It's Brisbane. I think I called it Brisbane. Okay, that's good to know. That's okay. That's (laughs) all right. I I train all my North American friends. (laughs) And so I was wondering if you could um, start off by just telling me a bit about yourself. I live in Brisbane. I've been, I've been born here, bred here, lived all my life here. It's a beautiful part of the world. And I'm married for 31 years to a man that deserves a medal for putting up with me. <laughs> have uh, no, no kids, but we have a fur baby. I sort of retired about three years ago, but I haven't really stopped uh, so I don't really know what it's like to, I thought I'd have this lovely quiet life and uh, I've just not stopped learning and I've met some amazing people in the last few years. So yeah, I'm that's sort of me in a nutshell after a long career in admin as a personal and, an, and, and as a personal assistant. So yeah. Amazing. And now you're doing work in, in sobriety, which is amazing. Yeah, I'm doing coach, I'm getting into coaching now. So it's really good. It's really interesting. So we'll hear more about that as we go on. But I was wondering if you could tell me a bit right now about your drinking. So when did you start drinking? When I started work, I I had a very sheltered younger life. I'm an only child. So um, I started work at 17 and in the government and uh, state government public service and in an admin job. And to fit in, uh, because I had such a sheltered life, I didn't have a lot of self-worth, didn't have a lot of self-confidence. So I initially started drinking to fit in. And the thing at the time was you worked hard, but you went down to the, the local pub at lunchtime and, you know, had a few, came back, you know, you might go again after work. You don't do that now. There's, um, I'm sure the codes of conduct that they have now are probably based on our mistakes Back in those days, that's just what you did. So as someone new to the workforce and not really having much of a, you know, I didn't really get out a lot. So I, this was all new to me, uh, meeting new people and just wanting to be friends with everybody. I just started going down uh, to the pub at lunchtime mm-hmm. with everybody else and uh, sort of started from there when I was about 17. And so how did it then escalate over time? I think over time, I, I'm a recovering people pleaser as well. Mm-hmm. And so the fitting in bit and the people pleasing bit, um, I ended up with jobs that were more stressful, but I loved it because I liked to feel needed. Uh, and I, I was always someone, because of my people pleasing, I was always someone who had to have my ducks in a row. So I always had jobs where I had you know, I was always having balls in the air type jobs. You know, there was always, I always found jobs where you just had one thing to do really boring. So I love jobs where I had lots to do, but people relied on me to do that and do it well. And so, but that came with a certain amount of stress. So the the escalation came from not just fitting in, but then it was my coping mechanism. And I think things changed when it became my coping mechanism for stress and then for life. You know, I had, I'd had, I might have a death in the family, or then it'd be a wedding, or then it would be a new job, or I'd lost a job, or, you know, or things were bad at work. And, you know, like everything, I used it for everything. So it escalated 
really badly right into my 40s probably and uh, that's I can see a pattern of behaviour that if I could go back, there's one particular job and I think if I could go back to that point in time uh, and tell myself don't use it for stress, yeah. that would be, yeah, it was a clear indicator, yeah, that, you and, know, you live and learn. Yeah, and so many people do that, right? It's like we, I don't think that we're equipped as young people with the tools to manage our stress. And then when we find that alcohol works, that's what we do because we don't know, we don't know better. No. And if it's the only tool that you know, the only tool that you have, one of the tools that uh, all the marketing tells you yeah. is the go to as well. Um, you so you don't think that you're doing anything bad or different to anybody yeah. else because everybody else you know is doing the same thing. So yeah, if it's your only go-to, it's just a natural progression. Yeah, absolutely. And so tell me, what was the turning point for you when you decided to quit drinking? Wow. Well, I had gotten really sick a couple of years prior. And I was in hospital for two weeks. I had an enlarged heart. I had pneumonia. I ended up, while I was there, I was diagnosed with diabetes. I was really sick. And they told me at the time that my potassium levels were so low that they only saw those levels in dead people. I I actually had a doctor tell me that. And I was so really out of it, I didn't really understand. And it wasn't until after I left, I sort of went, yeah, yeah, okay. And... (laughs) I didn't realise until afterwards that um, you actually need potassium to make your heart do what it does and beat. And so if your heart is at a, if your potassium level is at a point where it's so low they see it in dead people, that means the heart, no wonder it was enlarged, it was trying to keep me alive and working so hard to do that from all the alcohol abuse mm-hmm. that um Yeah, and so I didn't really understand that at that point um, I had almost uh, checked out. So then uh, I spent probably the next year recovering from all of that. I I got through the diabetes. They said they expected me to take two years to work through it and get my health back, but I did it in a year. So I went, yay me, I can moderate. This is something, this is what I'll do. I can drink again because I didn't drink for a while because I was just too sick. But I then I got into that mindset where I thought I could moderate. But then I found myself um, in the months leading up to when I finally did stop. Uh, I was just sick all the time. I I went from being the employee that everybody could rely on to not totally the opposite. I was never, I was always away from work. I was always sick. I always had migraines, I had wow. stomach issues, my depression and my anxiety and developed into panic attacks that were just, oh, I would yes. try to go to work and I'd get halfway down the street to the train station and physically, I still remember there was one particular day that I got down the street and I felt I couldn't have felt any worse than if there was a brick wall right in front of me. I just physically could not move down the street. Wow. and. I had to turn around. The only thing that could help was I had to turn around and come back home, lock the door, and and I felt safe again. And that just kept escalating. And so then I would come home and I would drink and I would black out and then more migraines, then more stomach issues. It was just I went, here I go again. And I realised one day I had a doctor's appointment for this particular morning and I woke up because I'd been away from work again and for so I needed a medical certificate. And um I just woke up that morning and I just went, I don't, I don't think I've got another recovery in me. I actually think that I'm so I'm getting so bad again that um this is what happened to me before I ended up in hospital. And my marriage was suffering. I mean, it was no fun to live with, can you imagine? And I just sort of went, I can't. I Mm -hmm. I don't think I've got another recovery. I don't think I can do this. And I had absolutely no idea what I would do, but I knew I couldn't, that what I was doing wasn't working. Right. 
so I actually was like an hour early for my doctor's appointment and I still remember to this day the impetus. I try to explain it to people, but it was like I'm sitting on the couch going, I know that I've got my appointment in like whatever time it was. And I went, no, I have I had this physical urging, get up, get in, the call a cab, go now, go now. And I went, I'm going to be so early. I had this little mental tussle in my and I went, go now. And I just walked in the door and the reception staff he had at the time, they knew me. I'd been a patient of his for a fair while and I'm still a patient of his. And they took one look at me and they just went, Let's take you into the nurse's area. Yeah, it's just amazing. I'll never forget that day. I don't think I have no idea where that that urge came from, but I I just I just woke up and knew that I couldn't keep going the way that I was. That I was just wasn't going to recover a second time. I I'd already um, you know I felt like a cat that had had nine lives, and I re- I reckoned I was up to the ninth. Wow. I just. Time to go. Time to make a change. Mm. Yeah. So and it was. That was the day. And yeah, I really reaching out was. I mean, I went in and I saw him, and I just said, you know, I, I don't know. And he almost went, "Hallelujah," because he's he'd been saying to me for the longest time, you know, you're not well, and let's talk about this. And he tried to do all the right things, but I wasn't ready to listen. And also because part of being an only child, I think, is you have, for me anyway, my mindset is that I didn't really have anyone I could rely on. So I was always fixing things myself. So I thought that this was something that I could fix by myself as well. So I spent many years trying to to do that. And uh, just what, I really didn't have any tools. I just thought white knuckling was what you did. And um just tried to manage by myself. And so many times he would try to say to me, you know, let's talk about this. And I go, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. But on this day I just went, I don't know, throw it at me. I have no idea what to do. I just need to be doing different. So um, he was excited and he's still excited for me. And uh, he's a lovely, lovely man. And um he supports me. I know people talk about how they don't get support from their medical professionals, but he's just been one of my cheerleaders from day one. So I'm very, very fortunate. Oh, wow. What a story. <laughs> Shout out to the good doctors out there. They don't get yeah. enough kudos. Yeah. Oh, and if wow. you haven't got I'm a good shivers. one, keep looking. I have two. Just going through that again, I, um, yeah, I, Honest to goodness, so yeah, it's. I still don't believe it myself sometimes. So I, I don't know. Don't know what it was about that day. I just woke up and just went enough. Yeah, mm. and I think there are. It's like a moment. It's a moment when you decide, um, and that's necessary, right? Because no one else is going to make the changes for you. And if people suggest them to you, it's it's until you have this shift internally and it sounds like that's what happened for you where you're just like okay today's the day today was that was the day yep fourth of september it's just passed wow and what year was so, that seven years now seven years wow mm. congratulations thank you yeah it was hard because it wasn't um there wasn't much around at that point yeah. you know it was be- before a lot of the books that people talk about now yeah, it was really actually because that was 2014, and for some reason I, I felt like a tap turned on in 2015 mm-hmm. when books started to totally. appear. Yeah, and so it was then because he was really my doctor. He's really into mindfulness, and I think that really changed my life. Uh, and but the books that told you more about the science of it, mm-hmm. I think that's what kept me sober. Because I I was changing my mindset, but I think it was understanding because I've always been someone who had to know why about something and drives people insane. But I I think those books helped me understand the why of it and so that together with what I was learning about changing my mindset, uh, really that was the game changer. But, yeah, that was the, the interesting year. 
And so what, um, when you did start, like when you're going on your sober journey, what were the key tools that you used to, to help you? Uh, yeah, mindfulness and learning yeah. to live in the moment because yeah. one of the reasons that I drank was a lot, of, a lot about past issues. Yeah. And uh, I had to learn a certain amount of uh, acceptance and it's really hard, but um, once you actually let go of the things that you, you can't change mm-hmm. and you, the things that you wish were different, as much as you would like them to be different, you have to give yourself the apology that you're never going to get and you just have to live in the moment. And I'm the other end of the spectrum is that I'm also an overthinker. So part of my, I used to dread my anxiety, um, which is tons better now. I mean, finally through mindfulness, I came off medication for anxiety and depression and Being able to live in the moment stopped me future predicting as well because I was always overthinking and and the anxiety that I I was going to say that I used to to dread, now I see it as my little superpower because it makes me very aware of what's going on around me, which is also very annoying to some people. (laughs) But I see it now as a gift um, instead of fighting against it. And I think every time... We fight against something, whether it's anxiety and hating that it's part of our life, whether it's drinking and wishing it wasn't part of our life. Every time we fight against something, that's where I find you you just seem to make it harder. And as soon as you sort of let go and just allow it to be and allow yourself to have a different mindset to uh, about how you approach these things. Yeah. Suddenly that the whole beast that was on my shoulder from anxiety and from drinking, it was like, you know, I could just, they weren't important anymore. So mindfulness was a huge game changer uh, and learning to live in the moment. Saved my life. Saved my life. Yeah. And that is so much about actually what my, my community is about, obviously, because I do so much yoga, so much meditation. Um, and that for me as well, I can so relate. Like I was actually practicing yoga and teaching yoga long before I got sober. Um, but when I did finally quit, it was like I had that solid foundation of those practices and my and I got deeper into them and um and they played a huge role in my journey as well. So I can totally connect to that. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a, and it seems so simple. It's not easy, but it's, it is relatively simple, but it's the repetition of learning to do something new until it becomes second nature. Cause we're always in a hurry, aren't we? We want, we want the quick fix, you know, I, I want to lose weight. So I'll eat the salad today. And I went for a walk today. Right. Why aren't I, you know, a couple of kilos lighter and you go immediately But it just takes practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, It does happen. It does happen. But it, I, I think I got impatient with myself, and I, and I see it in 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 sober groups as well that I mentor in. That yeah, you just want you've taken decades to get where you are. In my case, and then I want the overnight success story, but. It just takes, you train the brain that that's your go-to. Yeah. And so you've got to, uh, it took me, but the, the learning the whys about it was um, understanding that I've actually created neurotransmitters that need to be like, like you've got to really teach the brain a whole new way of thinking. So you've got to create new neurotransmitters and new pathways to of thinking. And it really does take time. So I know I remember getting impatient with myself that why isn't this happening? You know, so but it does. It's just repetition, which doesn't sound very exciting, does it? But um it's part of the journey. Yeah, it's a practice. Exactly. Mm. And we don't get in the car and know how to drive, do we? So straight mm -hmm. away, you know, and we don't learn to walk on the same day we try. So we're so hard on ourselves. Yeah, that's a great metaphor. It's so true. So what for you was the hardest part of the sober journey? 
that would have to be my hardest part was the learning to giving myself the self-compassion to understand that it did take me a long time to get there. That was my heart. I was so hard on myself because I've always had a mindset that I had to do, I still do it today. I, I mean, having just told, given you these fantastic analogies, but I, I still do it when I'm doing something new that I go, I've got to do it right the first time. That's always been my, you know, I don't know, it's part of my upbringing, I think, you know, and if I haven't done it right the first time, then I'm the worst person in the yeah. world. So that was the hardest thing was that, um, I mean, I guess I did get to that point that day, but I had tried to quit several, Not I did uh, a mental shift beforehand, but there were many times where I tried to moderate and I right. promised myself that I was only going to drink, you know, I had all the rules and everything. So um, I I spent a lot of time getting to that point um, of, of, of that day of stopping. But it, all those times that I tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed and then you had the mental fight with yourself about how you should be doing better and you should know better. And so, yeah, that so by the time I actually, it, it was a real journey of probably at least five years before I got to that day. It wasn't spontaneous. It was probably spontaneous on that day, but I'd been trying for about yeah. five years, really realizing that I had a problem. So, but I still then I was sort of beat up on myself about how it took me so long to get to that point. You know, why didn't I realize? Well, how, look at all the time that I've wasted, and um, you know, getting to that point. And what's wrong with you? You know, how come you took so long? It's it's you should know better. And you know, so. I had to fight all those mental demons as well uh, in my healing journey. So um, that was hard. Yeah. That was hard, giving myself the self-compassion that all of that is the journey. Uh, I have a friend who talks about the sobriety journey being um, a bowl of spaghetti because it's it's messy and it's not a straight line. The spaghetti is all whirly girly and you know all over the place. And and I really uh, I love that analogy because it's so true. But we just we're just so hard on ourselves that we just don't give ourselves enough compassion to to because you know if we if it was our friend who was going through that, say your best friend, you'd go, oh come on, don't be so hard on yourself. You know you're trying, aren't you? You, you know and but it's not what we do for ourselves. So that was that was the hardest part was learning the new things that I'm that what my new go-tos were to putting them into practice, mm -hmm. but also um giving myself that patience yeah. to um allow again that was part of acceptance, I suppose, was that it was um it's just the way it happened. Yeah. You know, it's just it's just the way it it may have been a bit ugly. It was ugly at times, um, but it's my journey and just to own it and to live better now, live in the now. Yeah, love that. And so what for you was, what were the best parts of, or what have been the best parts of being sober? Best part is that once I got focused on mindfulness and learned those new tools, my anxiety just and my depression yeah. I went off the medications and this took time as well, um, but it, it changed my life to realise that I could actually, because now the tools worked, because before it was like using the anxiety, using the alcohol, which would only inflame the anxiety, and it was just such a relief that because before nothing worked I know, except what I thought was the alcohol. And now it was like, oh, wait, when I use this tool that my doctor told me about, you know, this mind technique, it works now because now I'm, I'm, I have such mental clarity. I have so much more control over what I, what I, my decision making that everything changed once I could manage my anxiety. Um, I didn't get the panic attacks anymore. I don't think I've really had a panic attack for many years because they dissipated over time. And anxiety, I still get a little bit of it, but now I see it, as I was saying, I see it as my little superpower because 
I realize now it's trying to tell me something. Yeah. And and I go, now I'm learning to have faith that to listen to my body. Yeah. And understand when it is trying to give me a message. And and so, for instance, something happened earlier this year. And I realized it was telling me that the situation that I was in, the reason I had anxiety was I was just not in the right place for me and that I had to make a different decision. And until I realized what that message was, you know, and then when I realized then I didn't have anxiety anymore, but it was listening to my body now is so, um, so important to me. And now I understand that my anxiety is almost my little radar you know, it's telling me, you know, it's still it's still doing the overthinking, looking out for me. But now I understand that it's it's actually trying to tell me something. That it's it's that's why it's a gift um, yeah. because it gives me this self awareness that I um, I didn't appreciate before. So that that was a huge thing, and to be able to do that without medication. But mind you, I mean, no judgment. I mean, I would if something happened, I would go back. To medication, I, I think yeah. that that's um, totally. It's it's more than I was, going to, I was going to use the word useful, but it's more than useful. It it helps you function sometimes. Yeah. You know, like you just I, I wouldn't hesitate if something happened and I needed to go back earlier uh, a year or so ago. I was going through something and I said to my doctor, oh, "I don't know. I think I need to go back on them." And he said, "Really? Well, let's talk about that." And Let's give you some tools to use between this this session and our next session, and then go off and have a think about putting them into practice. And when you come back, then if you say to me, "No, I still want to go back. I want to go back on them. We'll we'll talk about that then." And he was agitated when they're right. He was right because when I went away and had a tool to use. Um, which I now forget what it was, but I remember going away and I had something. St- <laughs> I remember going away and doing something and, and then when I did go back, I said to him, yeah, yeah, I'm okay now. I'm fine. It was just a thing and I was just upset about something and, yeah, he, and he was right. But it was so, yeah, my anxiety is the biggest gift out of out of it all of, of not uh, of being able to control it and uh, and so it rarely appears now as I say it's you when it does I realize that it's telling me something yeah. but sleep also huge shift in not waking up at 3 30 in the morning business you know that got old real quick so and actually having whole weekends like I would black out from Saturday lunchtime and then I would hear my husband in the shower thinking it was Sunday morning. I'd black out on the couch and I'd hear my husband in the shower and I'd go, oh, it's Sunday already. And I'd look at my iPad and it'd be, and I'd, you know, open up the screen and it would say, oh, it's Monday morning. And I'm going, that happened way too often. So wow. I love having my weekends back. I get a whole, especially yeah. when I was still working, you know, it was, I suddenly, suddenly just went, oh, my God, I actually had a proper break. I've rested. I've seen people. I've remembered conversations. I've done things and I've had the whole two days, you know, I would would remember everything. And it it was just wonderful. And I still wake up Monday mornings going, I love Mondays now. I used to hate Mondays with a passion. Um, but now now I love them. I love the start of the week. So, yeah, all that. It's it's all a gift. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I totally agree with you. It's like once you've had a rested and positive and happy weekend, it just completely, it's a game changer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you realize how much you've been missing out on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just, it still blows my mind, all that. But yeah, you know, all that time I wasted. But I went, oh well, it's I can't take it back, can I? So you, yeah. it's um, it's really I did get into shame and blame of myself for a long time, and then I just went, oh, it's not serving you, right? You know, you you can't change it. So you just the best you can do is is live a really healthy life now. So. And they say the best apology is change behaviour, so I'm a big believer in that. So for the people around me, 
I just um, live my best life as well. And so tell me about, um, so you are now doing, you've done some coaching courses. Um, I know you're doing a little bit of um, coaching volunteer work, looking to get into that. So tell me about how you started with all of this and what kind of work you do. Oh, gosh, uh, this has changed my life. This is why I don't have a quiet retirement. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Because now I have this whole new uh, focus in life. I joined the This Naked Mind, The Path, Mm -hmm. and while I was in that, one of the coaches that I had said to me, why don't you mentor in the live alcohol experiment? Because I had one coming up in October, nearly a year ago, October last year. And uh, and I said, oh, really? And you don't coach, but the idea is that during the 30-day experiment, um, and there's a team of us, um, because I had already been privately mentoring, I should backtrack a little bit, from about the middle of the year, um, I went on to Simon Chappell's uh, Facebook page and he has a special section just for mentoring. And it struck me, I got talking to my husband and I said to him, Surely all this has got to have been for something, everything that I went through. Yeah. Um, and so part of my own healing journey was to give back to see if anything that I've learned, any tools that I've learned, any things I've learned about myself, mindset stuff, you know, was it worth passing on to tell other people? So he said, well, give it a go. It's, it's only for, uh, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to have all the answers, but if you can, if you want to help someone, you know, so I just put my name up and I had people contact me. So I was privately mentoring through that for a while. And then, yeah, I joined the path and then I still see, I still in contact with two of those people and we don't, I don't really mentor them now. They're, they're both alcohol free for more than 12 months now. And they're wow. just awesome ladies and they're um, fantastic. So they don't need me. We're just friendly now. Um, but, yeah, and then when I was mentoring in the first, the October alcohol experiment, um, it's a team of mentors. And so the coaches go through the daily content of the alcohol experiment and explain what it all means. And, and they do live uh, live calls to the Facebook page. And the mentors are there as more like a cheer squad and uh, to help people, we're on the Facebook page a lot and just to sort of say, keep going, you know, and, and this is what's worked for me and, you know, you can do this. And so, and then it just, I kept, I did that again the next time they had one and I just really like it. And on the path I'm doing um, connection calls and they're peer-to-peer, they're not, they're not coaching either, but they're really lovely to do they the people there they everyone's on a different part of the journey uh and we just lift each other up I can go on a call feeling like a eh, four out of ten yeah maybe I'm not having a stellar day I get on those calls and I I just by the time I finish I'm uplifted myself so you know I get taught as much uh from their support um it's it's always you know you get some of the regulars and there's but then you get a nice mix of new people, and it's uh, there's no shame or blame. There's just it's just an acceptance of where we all are on the journey. Um, so they're really fun to do as well. And so yeah, all the um, so then I mentored a few times, and then I had this is a funny story. Two different coaches who weren't talking, where well, they they knew each other, but they they didn't know that each of them on the same day within hours of each other but because of the time difference I got told about it about Jolene Park's um, grey area drinking coach training by one coach and she sent it to me she's in Canada and she sent it to me like late I was going to bed I'm an early I go to bed quite early it was like 9 or 9 30 and uh, she sent this link to me and I said I think you know with all the mentoring that you've done and I I had actually gotten up the gumption to send an email to this naked mind about their coach training, but I was still like on the waiting list. They hadn't opened it up for the, for the next course yet. And that was a journey because the year before I was going to put in for it, but then I got scared and I wasn't good enough and imposter syndrome and all that didn't put in for it. So the next year I went finally with um, the coach's um, support in the past program that I was on 
They went, no, you've got to put in for it. But while you're waiting, you might like Darlene Park's course. And I went, oh, okay. So it was late in the evening, so I thought, I'll look at this in the morning. And I'm sitting there next morning at this computer. I opened up the link and I went, I'm just starting to read it. And an email comes from <laughs> another coach that says, you know, I've been thinking, while you're waiting to hear about whether you get wow. accepted into coach training, you might like this coach. And I went, oh, ding, same link, you know, and I went, oh, my God. So I went, okay, I think I have to do the Jolene Park course, which was awesome. Uh, I she's And I'm now in her mastermind uh, program, which we meet a couple of times uh, a month, and uh, there's a bunch of us and that have all done her different cohorts. And she's just amazing. She's just learned. I continue to learn so much from her. And um, and then, yeah, then uh, I did get accepted into the This Naked Mind coach training and became certified uh, six months of training and with them and got my certification confirmed on my soberversary. So that oh, was wow. really the universe is freaky. They didn't they didn't know that it was my soberversary. I just get it was actually the next day here, but it was still the fourth of September in the States when they sent it to me. And I went, I'll take it. I'll take it. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. Um, it's just I've met some incredible people. That's been life changing as well. Between the two courses, I have learned so much about myself. It's not just been professional development, it's been self-development as well. It's been amazing. And then um, breaking news on the weekend, I signed up. You uh, interviewed the amazing Alex and Lisa from yeah. Manchester and Be Sober, uh, and I reached out to them the other day and I asked them if I could join their, their coach team, their coaching team, and uh, they were very, very nicely accepted. Um, so I'm going to be on their coaching team as well, on the Be Sober uh, coaching team, and I'm also going to be one of their ambassadors here in Australia. So there's only one other person who's all the way over the other side of the country in Perth. So I'll be waving at her from across the the great southern land, and, um, yeah, it's it's going to be really interesting. I, I love Alex and Lisa. I've been following them. When I emailed them, I said, I've been stalking you for <laughs> since they were since they were doing uh cyber sessions with um Simon Chapel, uh William Porter and Dave right. Wilson. And yeah, so I I really love seeing their journey or all their journeys, but the two ladies, it's been wonderful to see how much they're achieving and how the lives that they're changing. And I was just sort of looking at that the other day and I went, Oh, I I'd like to, if they would have me, I'd really like to join join their team as well. Yeah. So they were really lovely and, um, yeah, it's just we're going through all the paperwork at the moment, so really exciting. Oh, that's fantastic. That's so amazing. Mm. Oh, it's just like the circle of life. It's like all these people that are suddenly I, I'm meeting that I never would have met Never. My my life has changed so much. And even in just the last, not just the last seven years, but even in the last three years or so. And then I, out of the blue, you you message me. And at the same time, you know, Jeff from Getting Back to Zero yeah. messaged me. And, you know, that was so awesome. And um, I'm just, just thrilled to be able to share because I, I just think that giving back is... I, I can only, this is the only way I can see that, you know, there's meaning in what I went through is to just be able to share my journey um, and just to let people know that, you know, not to struggle on their own. So they're not alone, that we're all here, we've all walked the walk. Absolutely. So, yeah. And it becomes it's exciting times. way. Sobriety becomes way less of a lonely place um, when you know other people who have who have been through it. So any yeah, any people definitely. that we can touch by sharing our story, even if it's one person, um, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I really believe that. I, I just well, it's why I do the calls on the connection calls on the path, and it's why I do the mentoring. It's just 
you know, it is such a lonely journey sometimes until you you reach out. Yeah. Um, so I always tell people, you know, I've had people on the connection calls upset with themselves that they they had a blip. And and I and I go, yeah, but you know what you did? You turned up and you reached out. You came to this call. And yeah, that's that's what's important. So yeah, I, I think connection is hugely a, a game changer. Totally. All right. I have one more question for you. Um, do you have any advice for someone who wants to quit drinking? Someone had that question for you. What would you say? Oh, gosh. I have a couple of pieces. I actually, I was thinking I'm going to write a couple of things down, so bear with me because yeah. I didn't want to forget anything because it's more than one thing. But one of the things was to take a leap of faith in yourself yeah. that you that you can do it. It's some some things are above your pay grade, so it's okay to reach out. It's yeah. okay to ask for help. So just to understand that, you know, it's alcohol makes you live a very isolated and insular life. My world got very very small, but the second that I reached out and asked for help and realized that I couldn't do it by myself, that was the game changer. So I always tell people reach out and make yourself your new favourite hobby because make all these things that you're going to learn, they take practice, they take repetition and enjoy the enjoy the journey trying mm-hmm. to figure out what works for you. Um, it's different for everybody. Like the gym is, it works for me both mentally and physically and it gave me a confidence in myself so that when I had to make decisions about boundaries and protecting my sobriety, it was a weird thing. Achieving achieving things in the gym gave me a confidence that I could say, no, I'm going to put my health first. All my decisions are going to be based around being the best version of me. And it was a weird thing of getting that confidence from going to the gym which sounds, it, to me, it sounds weird when I try to explain it. But when that confidence built up, then I had that confidence then to say, no, I'm not going to go to this event. Or I would go to something and I'd go, how I'd have an exit plan. So, but I made myself my my new my newest and my best hobby yeah. so that I was always working on myself. So I made myself the priority. And I think um, that's a that's a game changer as well. And mindfulness, totally. Um, it's not all. It's not just about reading quit lit books. It's uh, any self development books that you can find that you can put your hands on that t- teach you about living life in the moment. Totally, totally changed my life. And weirdly, too, it doesn't sound like it would, but it helped me with cravings. It helped me focus it helped me breathe and all of that helped me push through any of the harder moments or the harder days um it really it some things don't seem obvious that they're good for um quitting alcohol but yeah. it really um though those were the pivotal things that I really wanted to share that that worked for me yeah well thank you so much great advice And Lisa, it has been so wonderful to finally meet you after so much um, connection on social media and mutual friends. And it's amazing Uh, how the internet can just bring two people from like different parts of the world together. So I love it. It's wonderful. Yeah. So great to meet you too. And your cat. I have a cat. Mine's being antisocial. She's over there. <laughs> Mine really likes to get involved and I get worried when I'm doing the podcast interviews that she'll like mess up all the cords, but she's good today. <laughs> good. <laughs> oh, it's been wonderful to meet you too. So great. Thank you. Thank Lisa. you for the opportunity and, to share. You. And I'm sure we will uh, meet again in the sober world. I'm sure. I would love that anytime. Ask me. I'm always around. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa, and have a great day and we'll speak soon. All right. See you soon. Bye. Bye.